Lee Jussim, a distinguished professor in the Department of Psychology at Rutgers University, New Jersey, has found himself denounced as a racist simply for using a quotation from the musical Fiddler on the Roof. Jussim began an academic paper by using the quotation, of course, there was the time he sold him a horse and delivered a mule from the song Tradition. But the reference did not find favour with other academics. I'm joined now from New Jersey by Lee. Good evening, Lee. Thanks for joining us. Good evening, Andrew. Thank you for having me. So why don't we start at the beginning? You had uh, written this article. Perhaps you could give us some sense of what the article was about. The article <clears throat> was essentially a uh, critique of the way in which diversity rhetoric is used in academia. And the core idea was that it's used disingenuously. So diversity kind of has come to mean two different things. The conventional meaning is like lots of different things. Diversity. In fact, my article was titled The Diversity of Diversity because the word can mean two different things. So most people, I think, think diversity means lots of different things. There's environmental diversity, biospecies diversity, lots of different species, lot, you know, bio, right? It's just lots of different things. Okay, but, but in progressive circles in general and academia in particular, uh, there's a very narrow form of diversity, which is restricted to providing uh, benefits to groups the far left deems worthy of receiving special benefits. And the main point of the paper was to press academia to be honest about its use of its term, because often what it's doing is selling to the world diversity in the broad sense and delivering it in the extremely narrow politicized sense. I mean, this is a common feature, isn't it, of critical social justice activists, is that they use language in such a slippery way. It can have more than one meaning, and they sort of rely on the good nature of their audience to interpret it one way, when actually they're kind of smuggling in other discourses. Right. Right. I mean, that's exactly right. And that's what's... The, the, the context was a discussion of a prior paper, and the prior paper did exactly that. Right. So you're criti criticizing this other paper. And in order to do, to do so, or to make your point, you invoke the song Tradition from Fiddler on the Roof, and this, right. in particular, this lyric. What, what, what were you trying right. to say by, quote, by quoting this lyric? Well, that, uh, that academia was, metaphorically speaking, uh, when it promises uh, uh, diversity, people hear it as diversity in the broadest sense. So it's uh, uh, promising a horse but delivering a mule, it's yeah. delivering this pared down, narrow, politicized, progressive form of diversity. And then why do people find that offensive? Um, I don't think anyone found it offensive uh, at all until it was denounced by a black Stanford professor as drawing on 19th century racist tropes. Um, so apparently, uh, in, you know, through maybe the mid 20th century, um, there was this association, uh, of, uh, American blacks who were primarily, you know, agrarian, agricultural, rural, uh, and mules. Um, you know, so mules were a common feature on the farm. Black people were common throughout the agrarian South. And so there is, there is good reason to believe that, you know, through about not, uh, 1950, uh, there was some association in some people's minds between black people and mules. And, and to be clear, so the author of the piece that you were criticizing, that was a black author, is that right? And then they've said yeah, that by yeah, quoting yeah. this line about selling a horse and delivering a mule, you're invoking yeah. this now obsolete, from what I can gather, uh, uh, racist association. Racist but surely... Yeah. You yeah. couldn't seriously believe that. That's such an uncharitable interpretation of what you're doing and obviously not true, right? <laughs> it's more than, I mean, in his paper, and this is a quote, uh, he claimed that I was drawing an explicit parallel between black people and mules. That's the quote. Um, unbelievable. I mean, so what happened then? So, th so you then had academics coming out in force against you. Can you talk a bit about that? Well, it was the whole picture was a little more complicated uh, because there were also, I mean, that's true, but, it, but it, in addition to being true, that's not the whole story. The, there were a series of papers that were accepted for publication 
discussing this original article. And there are allegations that the editor mishandled that process. And I sort of got caught up in that. My paper kind of got caught up in that. Um, and so there was an open very quickly when, after the denunciation uh, by the target author, uh, this uh, uh, Stephen Roberts, um, uh, academics organized on social media, uh, essentially an academic outrage mob formed within hours, uh, within a day, there was an online open petition uh, calling for the editor to be fired, denouncing all of us as racists, calling for all of our accepted papers to be retracted and for Robert's denunciation to be published instead. So what I find astonishing about that is there is absolutely no way that any of those academics believe what they are saying. And we know that they don't believe it because you would have to be an infant to actually make that connection. So what's going on here? This is, this is political expediency, right? That's all it is. It's just opportunism. I don't, I think many of them believe it actually. Really? Uh, so uh, uh, yes, I, I think academia, at least the American Academy has gone very, very far left. And I think there's an element of opportunism. There's an element of expediency. There's an element of a power grab. But I, in general, listen, I study political psychology, including radicalization. People usually, not always, but they usually believe what is obvious to other people as their own propaganda. So in other words, they are so um, accustomed to detecting racism and racist power structures that they really have started to see it in obviously innocuous places. Yes, I, I think that is correct, actually. Yes. So that makes it very hard, doesn't it? Because isn't the upshot of this that if you want, want to criticise an academic or a, a point that an academic has made, and if that academic happens to be black or happens to be gay or whatever, then you, you better not criticise him. Uh, that seems to be the uh, current evolution of academia. So what do we do about that? If academia has become so obsessed with group identity that we can't have a discussion about what is true and what is false anymore without bringing that into account, where does that leave the academy? Uh, I think it mostly leaves the academy as, at least on politicized issues, the quasi-scientific wing of far-left political parties. I, I think that's where it leaves academia. The issue of what to do about it is actually a complicated issue. And I'm not sure, you know, ideas have been percolating. Uh, you know, I think there has been some movement at, in the UK uh, to uh, include strengthen protections for academic freedom and punishments for uh, universities that violate academic freedom. We don't yet have that here in the US. People are advocating it and who knows what may, you know, how it's going to evolve. The, the problem here though, I, I think, is that the Democrats are unlikely to embrace anything like that. And the Republicans have a history of sort of excess of overreach and backlash when they do do things like this. So, for example, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the state of Florida um, is governed by Republicans. The, uh, the governor is re Republican. The state legislature is Republican. They recently passed the Stop Woke Act. What among the things that the Stop Woke Act does is all but eliminate tenure protections. Now, you know, if you see academia as like the enemy, then maybe what you want to do is just like as much damage to academia as possible. But if what you want to do is protect academic freedom, the last thing you want to do is revoke tenure protections. I think well, it's a really misguided response. Well, that, it doesn't sound like either side of the political aisle are going to do anything to improve this. But it's a fascinating story, Lee. I really appreciate you coming on to talk about it.